everybody. Welcome to Monday. It is so nice to see you here. I hope you had a really good weekend. Um, you know, I, I was really hot on this topic uh, last week. I thought I'd get over it. <laughs> not over it. Um, and the reason I'm not over it is because a lot of other people are getting pretty angry. And I think it's because they want the legacy of Wendy Williams to be protected. Um, full disclosure, I know Wendy Williams. I was on her show. I was a guest host on her show. I really liked Wendy Williams. Um, as talk show hosts go, she probably is one of the most friendly, affable ones that I ever met. I loved her diva uh, persona because at least when I saw it, it was all just a show and um, it was harmless. Not like some other divas that I've met. They're not very harmless. But um, the people who know Wendy, a lot of them seem to feel the same way I do. And that is that they are pissed. <laughs> that her legacy is being rubbed out by a documentary that shows her at her worst. This is the documentary. It's called Where's Wendy Williams? It's uh, breaking records everywhere. It's beat Gypsy Rose. And um, tonight, another friend of Wendy's, a big celebrity, king of daytime, Steve Wilkos, is going to join me in just a moment uh, because he has a few things to say about this and about her, and about this documentary. Uh, he also watched it, deeply affected by it. Steve Wilkos is coming up in just a moment. Do not go away. You have to hear what Steve has to say. He knows a lot about the background of the talk show industry, etc. And then there's Dead Man Talking, before he's Dead Man Walking. Uh, Michael Smith probably knows what it's like to make a date with death because he's got one, and it's coming up in a month. And he is talking exclusively to us about what it's like to actually count down the days to your own planned execution. Um, make no mistake, the murders that he's responsible for are atrocious. So you may feel nothing for Michael Smith, but you can't ignore the human condition and what it is like to know the day you're going to die. And then all the people around you on death row, how are they? What are they thinking about one of their members about to do the march? So we got this really great exclusive interview with him. That's coming up in a moment. And then goodbye, Idaho. Hello, Maricopa County. I'm not sure that Lori Vallow was quite as sing-songy as I just was when she was being extradited from very cold Idaho to very hot Arizona for yet another murder trial. I mean, why not? There are lots of them. Lots of murders in her life. She's serving uh, life, no parole, in Idaho for murdering her two kids and her husband's late wife. But she's now going to go on trial again for a couple other planned murders. One actually happened. The other one didn't, didn't work out. But she's facing conspiracy for both. And what's really cool, and you may not know this, about what it's like when you're in the intake, is that you have stuff. Like maybe you're arrested from the street and you got your pockets full of stuff. Or maybe you're extradited from your cell in Idaho and you got a little black box full of stuff. And Lori Vallow's little black box was captured on the sheriff's body cam. Here's a little snippet. This is regarding your uh, electronic items for your uh, court documents. Um, if you don't mind, we're going to be play placing this into property um, as safekeeping so you can release it to whoever you want to. I'm going to show you the rest of that body cam as she was processed into Maricopa County, getting ready for her trial there. And what else was in the little black box? All her worldly possessions. It's all she has. She ain't getting no more. She's officially an inmate for the rest of her life, no matter where she's going to serve for what murders. Okay, let's start here, though, from her earliest childhood. All Wendy Williams ever wanted was to be on TV. And that is not me talking. That is the queen, Wendy, talking. In the hit Lifetime docuseries called Where is Wendy Williams? She herself says it over and over again. Ironically, that docuseries is the furthest thing possible from what six-year-old Wendy Williams had in mind. Or what 59-year-old Wendy Williams needed. But the docuseries is breaking records. It is clearly a hit. According to Nielsen, 1.2 million viewers tuned in the day that it aired or soon after. More than triple the network's average primetime audience for the previous three weeks. The Wendy program even beat the prison confessions of Gypsy Rose Blanchard, another massive mega-hit documentary. 
But to many of Wendy's friends and supporters, it wasn't so much a hit as it was a hit job. A producer who worked on Wendy's talk show for 12 of the 14 years that it was on the air writes this of the series, Wendy Williams. Um, it crushed my spirit. I cried profusely. When Wendy Williams was at her peak, she was seated in the regal purple chair, clutching a mug, dishing out on hot topics. She was spilling tea, and she was bantering with her audience. Now, here's Wendy! Let's get started. I've got fire hot topics. Come on! How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> or should we say, how you booing? How you booing? That made me laugh. <laughs> I swear, I just love that. How you doing? Um, that Wendy Williams, far different from the Wendy that was depicted in the docuseries. She is now faltering. She is disoriented. She is sometimes very aggressive, very mean, every bit a dementia patient who also has a serious drinking problem. And towards the end of the documentary, Williams' publicist brings her to Los Angeles for a meeting with NBC Universal about starring in a new talk show, which is incomprehensible given the condition that Wendy was in. I don't have to be an expert for this. Take a look. They just wanted to get an idea of what would the show look like, how, you know, the dynamics of what that would be. And I said, I want to wear stuff like this. She did. And then I took off my boots and showed my feet. They were like, she wow. Did. Wendy, would you want to go to the Oscars? Oscars? Yeah. This weekend? What's Oscars? Well, the award show. Would you want to go to award show and, and, and walk the red carpet? Yeah. Oh, you would? Okay. Hmm. Okay. I want to wear this. Would you have taken Wendy to a meeting with NBC about a talk show in that condition? That publicist did. Another king of daytime, Steve Wilkos, was deeply hurt when he saw the Wendy doc. Steve was a frequent guest host for Wendy Williams, and he knew Wendy well. He posted this on his widely seen TikTok account. What they're showing is somebody is not protecting her. Um, it doesn't put her in a good light. I don't see how this serves any purpose at all. One, uh, her manager talking about, is she ready to do a podcast? She's ready. She's been doing this for 20 years. She's in no position to do anything, interviewing she should not be interviewing anybody. I got to tell you, I was disturbed and I'm saddened by, I feel people uh, using her. Um, they're, not, they're not protecting her. And Steve Wilkos joins me now live. Um, Steve, it's really good of you to, to be on the program with me. I just want to get your, your first reactions when you watch the documentary. You know, I was really surprised because I didn't even know it was coming out and uh, my wife and I were just flipping through channels and we came across it and I was absolutely shocked. Um, you know, a lot of people, when I posted that TikTok, a lot of people said, oh, this is karma. She would talk about celebrities in a bad way and she was mean. That's that's nonsense. Uh, like you, you said in your opening statement that uh, Wendy's a wonderful person. Um, we in show business, with the shows that we type to do, we're to entertain. We're not going to be bumps on the lawn. You better have a personality for people to watch. And that's what Wendy did. Listen, I don't even watch daytime talk. You know, this is my job. I don't follow it. But I was a big fan of Wendy because I'd been on her show. I was on her radio show when I got launched. She always made me feel real comfortable. She made me, whether she really believed it or not, uh, that she was, you know, champion for me. And she made you feel that way. And I, I love that about Wendy. And when she she got launched right after me and I would watch her show and I, I was a big fan of Wendy. Like I said, I didn't watch a lot of daytime talk, but I tuned in and Wendy was on, I watched it and I loved Wendy. And like I said, she couldn't treat me any better. 
I saw the way she treated her staff. She was great. Um, you know, we've all had experiences in the TV business where you see people, you know, they project something on TV and they're completely opposite um, off camera. I thought Wendy was really genuine, nice person, cared about people. And so when I saw this documentary, you know, I think about myself uh, over the past 17 years when I've had my own show and I struggled with things and had my own personal issues. And I can't imagine somebody would be having a camera and filming me when I was at my deepest lows and, uh, you know, filming me at my weakest points in my life. Uh, I'm very blessed that I have a great wife and a family that I believe would protect me and never let that happen. Um, now, I know Wendy's in a little different position because she has an appointed guardian. Um, who this person is, I have no idea. I don't know if anybody knows. But if you really care about a human, not even Wendy, if you care about a human being and you saw what was going on here, you would never allow this to air. Now, I got to imagine one reason why it airs because money is one's got to be a, a big overriding factor is uh, that this. When he's got a huge following, you see the ratings for this thing. People, everybody tuned in to watch it. When I posted this about Wendy, uh, millions of people commented on it. So I get that there's, you know, people want to know what's going on, Wendy. They, they're going to track. But let's have some decency. No woman, and again, I'm talking about Wendy, but no woman is going to want to see her wig being taken off, her medical conditions being shown, her feet in the condition that they are. If Wendy was in her right state of mind, I think she would be, she'd want to kill these people for doing this to her. Um, it, it's just sad. And I, I think it's disgusting that the people that are uh, like, what I don't understand is why her sister, who to me seems very caring, uh, normal, loves her, why her or her brother um, can't step in and be the guardian. That's This is why I'm confused about. Um, but obviously a judge oversaw this ruled that there you know that there needed to be an uh, independent guardian but i feel whoever that person is they are doing a great disservice to wendy williams uh, you know i i feel the same this guardian is new york appointed this is a state appointed guardian who over the course of a year of filming somehow allowed this to happen somehow allowed wendy williams to be the executive producer on this her son to be executive producer on this her manager to be executive producer on this and it looks like the manager of all people you know you understand entertainment you understand what it takes to do a show you understand the mental acuity how on the ball you have to be in order to handle the rigorous scheduling uh, the demands of taping the live moments with an audience you understand that and you've seen what she was like being taken to that meeting at NBC Universal I mean I, I think I know what you're gonna say but there's not a chance in hell that any publicist or any manager who really believed in their client and cared for them would have taken them into a meeting in that condition I wouldn't take a human being out of their bedroom in that condition, right? I wouldn't take them out of the house. Um, and, you know, I would love to find out more about this meeting and, you know, NBC owns my show and I'm certainly going to ask some questions because I'd like to know who was it that took a, a meeting. But I, I'm sure they did not know that they were going to get the Wendy Williams that we saw in that car on the way to that meeting. <laughs> you know, that yeah. manager, whoever she was, the publicist or whatever, that is despicable, despicable that you would take somebody who's obviously suffering from, you know, very serious mental issues, addiction, and you're taken to a meeting. No person in the world is going to sit down with Wendy Williams in that state and say, yes, we're giving you a show. Um, you know, I, I'm assuming they say that she's in a medical treatment facility right now, which I got to imagine they is do. the best place for her to be. And I hope that she's getting They've all the medical that treatment that she yeah. needs. But there's any normal human being in this business, in this business that think that she's capable of doing any interview at all is out of their mind. So, and NBC, you know, for its part, there were no cameras allowed in there. They never uh, commented on this. They did not uh, offer a show up. I think you're right. They had no idea who was coming through the door and probably were as upset about 
the Wendy Williams they encountered as the Wendy Williams that, that we've encountered. So let me ask you this, just generally about the business. I mean, you've been in the business for a while, I've been in the business for a while, and we all come across different kinds of people. Generally speaking, I've come across great people in this business. I really have. But we both know that there are some, some bad apples. Yeah. And, and listen, you know, it's people say, you know, the criticism could be at me. And like I certainly heard on the Jerry Springer show, well, you exploited people. You exploit people coming on uh, TV and you show them in their worst light. Well, we're not putting drug addicts, uh, you know, alcoholics on the show. We're not putting anybody that has any kind of our uninfluence. We, we wouldn't never put them on TV. And we have psychologists backstage. We interview people. Uh, anybody that we would be deemed to have any type of mental issue, we're not going to put them on there. First of all, we don't ask anybody to come on my show. Everybody calls in. They want to be on the show. But you go through such a rigorous screening process, so we're, we're not exploiting anybody. When it's, and people have been arguing to me saying, well, when is the EP of this documentary? She consented. You cannot consent when you're not in the right frame of mind. When you right. don't have the mental capacity to know what you're doing, to agree to a, a contract, what judge would, uh, whatever contract she signed on this, I mean, I, I you know, maybe she didn't even sign it. I don't, I don't know anything. I, you know, I'm not throwing out accusations, but She's obviously mentally impaired. How can she enter into a contract that would show her in this light? And listen, I know there was some kind of lawsuit to stop this from airing. And because I think somebody probably did say, they must have screened it at the last minute and said, holy cow, what, what is going on here? Why is anybody going forward with this? Or the people that produced it said, man, we made a big mistake. Um, so I, I just think this is totally of exploitive of her. Um, and again, I, I think that uh, with her issues, uh, and I think, you know, Wells Fargo stepped in and said, hey, we're going to stop, uh, we're going to take control of your finances. A lot of people are mad about that. Oh, how can a bank step in? Well, I certainly would hope that if I was being swindled and somebody was stealing my money and I wasn't in a rate state of mind, I would hope that my bank would step in and stop the cash flow and I wouldn't end up with anything. I think Wells Fargo probably did the right thing here. Because if they let her windle down to zero, then people would be complaining why they let, you know, people steal Wendy's money. Sure. So listen, at the very least, I think somebody stepped in and said, hey, where is all this money going? Um, it's just flowing out. I'm glad that, again, I'm glad that somebody said, hey, we need to watch out for it. But the person that was assigned to this is not doing their job or they're not qualified to be a legal guardian um, and it's yeah. just very like I said, disappointing. A year. They let it go on for a year, and then suddenly, the weekend before it aired, they tried to stop it from airing. Well, it's a little too late at, at that point. Steve, I'm so glad to hear you uh, weigh in on this because, like I said, you're a good friend of hers. You know the business intricately, and um, it's important for people to understand how this happened, why this happened, and who may not be to blame and who may be to blame. But could you come back on the show? Love having you. <laughs> Anytime. Oh, I so appreciate it. And by the way, I'm going to tell all your fans, uh, check out Steve's TikTok because it is on fire. He's just great. And I love that you're on TikTok. So good for you. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Great to see you. Nice seeing you, Ashley. All right, coming up after the break, Dead Man Talking. Michael Smith set to be executed in 31 days. But today he spoke exclusively with us. He talked about planning for a date with death, why he thinks they're executing the wrong man, and what it's like for the other inmates as they watch one of their own marching down towards that date with death. That's next. idea when or how our lives are going to end. And most of us choose not to dwell on that. But is knowing when you're going to meet your maker any better? Living every day as if it's your last is a nice philosophy, but if you knew for certain what day you were dying, would you be any happier? Michael Smith is very well aware that he has 31 days left to live. And before I go any further, I need to make it crystal clear that most people who know Smith's story could not care less about his happiness. Quite the opposite. Because Smith, Smith is a, uh, a ruthless murderer. He's been on death row in Oklahoma for more than 20 years now. 
and he's set to be executed by lethal injection at 10 o'clock in the morning on April 4th. The murders that he was convicted of were absolutely barbaric. The pl- prosecutors say that he, uh, he emptied two guns into a store clerk because he just wouldn't die. And then, for good measure, he lit that victim's body on fire. But that wasn't the end of his crime spree. He then stormed into a woman's home, and he shot her dead because, according to him, she just wouldn't stop screaming, you know. Pow, pow. Smith's lawyers have tried to spare his life by claiming that he has an intellectual disability. But the state said that his IQ scores are too high for that. Earlier today, he gave us an exclusive interview by phone from prison, and here is a little bit of that conversation. The date of your execution is set for April 4th. Do you have feelings about that? Is it always on your mind? Do you try to ignore it? No, I actually um, don't think I think about it as much as people would think I would, you know, but um, I think it's it's more about the actual fights, you know, and instead about the actual date. No, it's just still still fighting, it's still praying and hoping that uh, that I can survive, you know. So I really ain't think about dying. And the fight, I guess, is about the, um, uh, your lawyers have been trying to show that uh, you might have an intellectual disability, uh, whereas the state says your scores, uh, your IQ scores are too high. Uh, do you, are you able to comment on that at all? Actually, the fight, my fight is about my innocence, first and foremost, but um, I think my um, in, in intellectual disability uh, claim in my um, case is, is just one of the factors. And I, I just want to ask you about the other part of what you said. Um, you talked about your innocent part. Um, the prosecutors yeah. uh, have said that, um, I guess, the evidence against you was overwhelming. Um, the, yeah. the crimes were um, a, a store clerk was, was shot and then his body was you know, lit on fire and then another woman yeah. was killed because she wouldn't stop screaming. Are you saying that you didn't do those things that you've been convicted of? Absolutely, I'm saying that. I, I always said that um, I, I gave a false confession under the influence of the PPT after um, being prematurely released from the site board area of the Oklahoma County Jail. That's how I was actually interrogated, and um, I gave these false statements. So as far as the evidence against me, it's, it's basically only four pieces of evidence ever against me. It was always um, my confession. Two people stated that I confessed to them that I committed to crime, excuse me. And a, and a woman that um, identified me, that, that ID'd me at the store before the, shortly before the, um, the store clerk um, was, was killed. But um, my confession, my initial listen to the crime, it, it, it consisted with the actual fact of the crime. My, my argument in the trial was always that I confessed to something that I was told, not to something I did. I basically confessed to a rumor. And while it's intoxicated off PPT. If that's true and the person's out there, what what do you think is the appropriate punishment if they find that person for these crimes? Oh, that's, 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 that's between him and God. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. The, I'm not the judge or the jurors. No, I couldn't. I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine putting this or, or any kind of punishment, any kind of punishment on another man, especially not like this. I would wish this on my worst enemy. I know death. Death sentence. This is this is cruel and unusual. Do you have interaction with the other death row inmates at all? Are you allowed to talk to them and communicate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we have. We talk a lot. And, we talk and a lot. We always been. Do you guys talk about you know impending possibility of being executed ever? Oh, mostly we 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 um we just just um help one another with with, with issues and uh. I'm like trying to figure out a way out, but we don't really talk about dying. We just talk about fighting. That's all, all we really discuss. It's all about the fight. Hmm. I want to bring in Reverend Jeff Hood. He is Michael Smith's spiritual advisor, and he plans to be at the execution on April the 4th, and he's a friend of the show. Uh, thanks, Reverend Hood, for, for being on. You know, he seemed pretty calm in the conversation that he had with our Chris Maloney, uh, who was doing the, the uh, interview there. And it seemed as though he is fixated on the fact that he's he's still going to fight and hasn't sort of come to terms with the dying part. And I'm just wondering if it hasn't hit him yet or if that is just sort of standard preservationist. It's just self-preservationist for everybody in his shoes. 
Well, thank you, Ashley, for having me, as always. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting moment. I mean, you know, we're talking about someone who uh, the state plans to kill in uh, a little bit more than a month. And the question, of course, is what would you think about? I think all of us would think about how do we preserve life? I mean, you know, you meet people who have cancer or any other sorts of illnesses. They are doing what they can to try to preserve life, and that's exactly what he's doing. Um, you know, I see this with a lot of guys that I work with, as you well know, that worked with guys um, all over the country doing this work, five guys in the last 14 months uh, who have been executed. Um, Michael is a, uh, you know, obviously there's a, a, a lot going on in this case, but Michael is someone who I think is really trying to feel his life, whatever life he has left, with life. So the evidence is overwhelming. Um, I know he is trying to, you know, have us believe that he falsely confessed uh, to the police and then to other people and that there's a witness who saw him. I think there was blood evidence as well of the, the victim's blood in his home. I mean, it is very overwhelming. Um, but it's hard. Uh, if you're on the fence about the death penalty, it's, it's, it's hard to feel sorry for him. Um, it's also hard for people who are against the death penalty uh, to feel like this is the, the, the right kind of punishment for, for someone. Because it's, you know, who are we to take a life? Isn't that God's job, you know? However, does he believe truly? Like, has he convinced himself, do you think, that he's innocent? Because I think O.J. killed those people. I just think O.J.'s convinced himself he's innocent. You know, that is an incredibly complicated question uh, for all of these guys. But specifically for Michael Smith, I think that... Uh, you know, he truly believes that he didn't do this. He has told me that he didn't do this. He's claimed repeatedly that he didn't do this. Um, you know, it, it's up to the state to prove that he did do it. And obviously, we've gone through all of the appeals. He's gone through trial. I think one of the problems with this process is these things that he's claiming um, that haven't been litigated, there are procedural bars to them being litigated. So, for instance, if he claims that there is new evidence or there, new evidence is found, that's not stuff that can be brought forward at this stage of the game. But I will say this. Yeah. I think for um, all of my guys uh, that I work with, I, I, you know, whether they're guilty, whether they're innocent, whether they're somewhere in between, the bottom line is if we continue to perpetuate murder, we're going to get murder. And so it is my prayer and my work that uh, we look at someone like Michael Smith and we restrain ourselves. Because if we don't, yeah. there will be more killers and more killing. It's, it's interesting how this country is 50-50. It's also interesting that he wouldn't answer uh, if he wasn't the guy who did the killings, what should happen to the guy who did? Oh, well, I wouldn't meet this out on, on anyone, which was pretty, pretty fascinating. Jeff, I hope you'll come back again. Always. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on. I appreciate your wisdom. There's nobody who knows more. He has been to multiple executions. All right, coming up next, what's in the box? What's in the box, Lori Vallow? The famous Idaho murderess checks into the Maricopa County Jail with all of her worldly possessions. Two hard drives with a connecting cable. Another connecting cable, if it looks like for the hard drives, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Two flash drives. HP laptop. Arizona rolling out the welcome mat and the check-in for their newest inmate as she prepares to go to trial again. And yes, it's for murder again. See what else is in her little black box. Next. Have you been to jail? Ever been arrested? I am not judging. Um, but it is a fair question because it turns out a lot of us get arrested all the time, in fact. Uh, there's data from the last 20 years that shows about 3% of people in America are arrested every year for all kinds of reasons. And if you do the math, that's about 10 million or so people each year, handcuffed and fingerprinted and photographed and processed. And the jails are busy. They're busy, busy places. The intake process can be fascinating, too. I'm, like, hooked on this stuff. Uh, there's pocket searches and strip searches and there's debobbling. <laughs> Debobbling of everyone, men and women and juvies. Every inmate has to cough up their jewelry and their piercings, no matter where they are. All their worldly possessions, at least what's on their person when they are cuffed and tagged, um, are bagged and kept, chronicled. 
Lori Vallow knows the drill. She has been put through the drill a few times now, most recently in Maricopa County in Arizona. And it was all captured on the sheriff's body cam. Uh, it's because she was transferred from Idaho, where she's serving life, no parole, for murdering her kids and her husband's late wife, uh, transferred to Arizona to face some brand new murder charges of two other family members. And she brought with her a little black box. Inside, all those worldly possessions that she had as an Idaho inmate. Take a look. Lori? So, remember, I kind of went over this with you. This is regarding your uh, electronic items for your uh, court documents. Um, if you don't mind, we're going to be play, placing this into property um, as safekeeping so you can release it to whoever you want to, um, legal, whatever. Uh, if you don't mind opening that just so we can document what's inside. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Looks like headphones, charging cable for the laptop. We have two hard drives with a connecting cable. Another connecting cable, for, it looks like, for the hard drives. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Two flash drives. I'll go ahead and have you uh, reseal that for me. Okay. This here is going to be your document. We can have your signature there. And then this here is all the paper, legal paperwork that you had. All right. And then snack for tonight. The broken glasses, they want me to put those in the property, so those are going to go in there. Okay. I They're different. I just They just bring them away here. Yeah. Okay. Um, any questions? All right. Good luck to you. Thank you. Okay. They're all so polite, and there was like such a huge audience there. Did you see them? There was like 15 people or so there. Let's not forget here that Lori is facing two murder conspiracy charges in Arizona for her ex-husband Charles and her niece's ex-husband Brandon. Uh, here's a look at her first appearance before an Arizona judge last month. She's sort of like all oh, smiles. Look at this. She's got like a bit of a bounce in her step. I remember this from one of her first appearances in Idaho, too, way back when, before she knew she was going to be put away for life. Her trial is supposed to start in August, but even the judge doesn't think that that's a realistic date for this case. And speaking of important dates, mm -hmm, you have to check out Crime Nation tomorrow night on the CW. I'm actually part of that docu-series, and tomorrow we're zeroing in on Lori's saga. And I have a quick sneak peek for you. Take a look. Lori's husband, Charles, is not quite as engaged in Lori's beliefs, but he is supportive to the point where he actually builds Lori her own special room in the house where she can get away from the family and dance to loud Christian rock. It was a big room, and she had it lined, the walls lined with mirrors, and he said every night she gets in there and she dances for two to three hours. Charles tried to embrace her sort of extreme beliefs as much as he could without understanding them. He tried to be welcoming to her new friends, but it got weirder and weirder, stranger and stranger. Charles called me one day. He said she dances. And she records herself, and she's sending it to some guy named Chad Daybell. And I said, well, who is he? And he said, well, he's in that crazy religion stuff she's doing. I told Charles, if they're not having an affair, they're getting ready to. I can tell you that much. Oh, man, crumb nation. And everything, Lori and Chad and the cult and the violent deaths and the people seeking justice, it is all tomorrow night at 8, 7 Central on The CW. I hope you will take a look. Coming up, um, you can turn your back on a lot of things, like TV and smartphones and computers and cars, and some of our American neighbors do just that all the time. They wouldn't have it any other way. But even for the Amish, 
The outside evils can come barreling into their world without warning, and sometimes with horrible results, like in Pennsylvania. A young pregnant Amish mother of two murdered in her own home last week. And the whole thing was a total mystery until the story of that home emerged. And that's next. Hot tenders and three mandarin orange tenders. Nice. Ooh. What about you? Three classic tenders. Four butterfly shrimp. Four of a kind, baby. I win. Looks like uh, somebody needs a new hand. Wait. I, Thanks for sharing. I, I, I'm not the buffet, guys. Well, most of us would feel naked if we misplaced our smartphones and naked if we couldn't buy our factory-made clothes, just like we buy our factory-made food and cars and furniture. The Amish, they are different. They set themselves apart, building their lives around family and community and faith. Modern amenities are shunned and violence of any kind is reviled. But sometimes violence makes its way into that community anyway. And a week ago today, in a remote corner of northwest Pennsylvania, a 23-year-old innocent Amish woman named Rebecca Byler was viciously murdered in her own home. Her throat was slit, she was partially scalped, and she may have been shot as well. She was six months pregnant and already the mother of two. Those children were home when her body was found. Police do have a suspect in jail tonight. That's him, 52-year-old Sean Cranston, and they've charged him with criminal homicide, criminal homicide of an unborn child, burglary, and criminal trespass. And one possible motive that's being reported will make your blood boil. I'm joined now by News Nation national correspondent Caitlin Becker. Um, Caitlin, thank you so much. Uh, what do we know about this guy? You know, we don't believe he's Amish. Ashley doesn't appear he's in the Amish community, but he does live locally, and the Amish community there in Pennsylvania and the non-Amish pretty much interact kind of all the time together, and they seem pretty amicable. This is certainly a bit of an anomaly. We don't know a lot about a motive. However, his former foster daughter told a local news outlet that she believes this is a case of mistaken identity, which doesn't sit well with me because it's very confusing, but she said that people that lived in the Byler's home years before they lived there apparently adopted his grandchild and she thinks perhaps he was just trying to get his grandchild back. Obviously there are a lot of holes in that, not knowing that there were new residents there for years seems confusing and also suggesting that if it was a case of mistaken identity then he allegedly meant to do this but just to someone else. It all seems a little confusing and way too violent. So the criminal complaint says this, the defendant did on or about 2 24 kill Rebecca Byler by shooting her in the head and or slashing her throat. Which one was it? It's pretty confusing. However, from what I understand, this information comes from what officers observed on the scene. So what they found is this woman laying in a huge pool of her own blood. And it said that there was an evident sort of slash wound from the front of her throat, as well as evidence of that scalping injury. So I don't know if they were also assuming because it was so damaging and so bloody and you had that behind the head of perhaps there was a gunshot as well. Certainly that would be cleared up in the autopsy. An autopsy was done and local police did say to the AP, that they do have an idea of what the murder weapon was based on the results of this autopsy. So it is certainly possible that she was shot as well as slashed. Lord, I'm sure they're going to get that cleared up. I mean, you know, the autopsy is going to know if there's a gunshot there. It's just that we don't at this point. What about the evidence that, that actually ties this suspect, Cranston, to this crime? Like, is it, is it overwhelming? Is it obvious? Are they even telling us? A little bit of both. There's one that's sort of obvious, and then there's a lot that they're just not telling us yet. There was a search warrant that was executed on his home that was looking for just sort of the gamut of things, Ashley. Obviously, any ammunition or weapons or things that can cut or slice or knives, fluids, fibers, DNA, that was all searched for when they executed that search warrant. We don't have the results of that yet. But what it seems connected police to Cranston was his car. Neighbors reported seeing a red Jeep that morning at the Bylaw 
Taylor's house, and a red Jeep was impounded by police outside of Cranston's house. So that does seem to be a pretty obvious connection here of how police got to him. Man, that is just gross, just awful. I can't imagine this woman, 23 years old. And her two pregnant. children. She has two small, yeah, at the home, two small children. Mm-hmm. I only wonder if they saw her body, you know, before her husband came home and discovered her, those two little babies. What a horrible story. Keep us posted on this. I, I'm really curious about how this possibly could have happened like this. Thank of you, course. Caitlin. Thanks, Ash. What an awful story. Okay, uh, I'm going to switch gears here. Coming up, sometimes clues to a killing can be found in the darndest of places like trash cans and laptops and surveillance cameras. But in a small town in Florida, a most unusual clue surfaced on the evening news. But it wasn't that person being interviewed right there. It was the guy behind her, behind that mom. What do you suppose he's doing with his hands? And why is that significant? I have the whole picture next. So it is not a crime to hover. It's not a crime to fidget. But depending on the time or the circumstances of your hovering and your fidgeting, it might not be a good idea to do it. A man described as the, quote, prime suspect in a Florida child's murder is in jail tonight. Stephen Stearns is his name. He is the last person to have seen 13-year-old Madeline Soto alive. Madeline disappeared a week ago today and her body was found on Friday in some woods south of Orlando. Stearns is the boyfriend of Madeline's mom, and police paid him a visit as part of an investigation, and they arrested him based on child sex material they found on his phone. Let's be clear, he hasn't been charged with Madeline's murder. Yet. But the charges he's facing certainly do make this video all the more creepy. While Madeline was still missing... Stephen Stearns popped into the background of the Zoom interview with Madeline's heartbroken mother on the local news. And he was seen right there in the background cracking his knuckles endlessly and fidgeting and generally just looking nervous, which is not exactly evidence of murder, but still, who does that in the background of that kind of an interview? Police say they are collecting actual evidence, but they do say that Madeline's mother is not a suspect in this case. We'll update you, though, if he does get charged in the big crime. That's it for us. Homo's next. Oh, it's getting hot in here. I'm Chris Cuomo, and I say let's get after it. Everything is getting hotter and angrier and more intense, and it's only going to continue this way. Everything is going to get forced through the lens of advantage because we are in the midst of the game and there's a big election and both sides think they can win.